Welcome to Atmos 5000, Day 2, where we, where we will be focusing in on Chapter 1, Sections 1.4 and 1.5. Today's objectives are to understand what temperature actually means and how the temperature scales that we commonly use were developed. We will look at layers in the atmosphere. We'll look at uh, how pressure and density vary with height. We'll introduce the International Standard atmosphere, and we'll talk about uh, the term geopotential. So let's start off with a temperature definition. Temperature is defined as the average kinetic energy of the molecules of a substance. So it really has to do with how quickly the molecules are vibrating or moving around. And we have an equation here, T is equal to A M W V squared. Um, a is a constant, uh, Nw is the molecular weight of the substance in grams per mole, and V is the molecular velocity in meters per second. And because this is a kinetic energy, uh, the temperature is proportional to the velocity squared. If we look at our traditional temperature scales, um, in the United States, we are most familiar with the Fahrenheit. The rest of the world uses the Celsius, and the scientific community uses the Kelvin scale. The Fahrenheit scale was actually set as 0 degrees Fahrenheit being a very cold winter day in Europe, and 100 being a very hot summer day in Europe. That's where that comes from. Whereas Celsius set 0 degrees C as the freezing point of pure water, and 100 degrees Celsius as the boiling point of pure water. And Kelvin simply adjusts the Celsius temperature scale so that when the temperature in degrees Kelvin gets to zero, uh, that signifies that all molecular motion has stopped. And that uh, is what we refer to as absolute zero. If we look at our temperature scales, and you can see that uh, the freezing point of pure water on the Fahrenheit scale happens to be 32. Uh, on the boiling point of pure water, it happens to be 212, and the difference between freezing and boiling points on the Fahrenheit scale is 180. On the Celsius scale, the difference between those points is 100, as is on Kelvin. So you can see that a essentially a 10 degree change in degrees Celsius will be an 18 degree change in degrees Fahrenheit. And that's pretty useful when you want to do a conversion between Celsius and Fahrenheit in your head. Just remember, a 10 degree change in Celsius is an 18 degrees change in Fahrenheit. Uh, the equations that we can use to convert, um, the 9 over 5 right here is essentially 18 over 10. That's where that ratio comes from. So you take your uh, temperature in degrees Celsius, multiply by uh, 9 over 5, and add 32 to get to Fahrenheit. If you already have Fahrenheit, you subtract off 32, and then multiply by the reciprocal, 5 ninths, to get the temperature in degrees Celsius. Um, the temperature in degrees Kelvin is the temperature in degrees Celsius plus 273.15, and uh, vice versa for the temperature in degrees Celsius from temperature in Kelvin. So how does temperature change with height? Uh, through a combination of weather balloons and rockets, uh, we can get an idea for how temperature changes with height. In the lower part of the atmosphere, in the lower 10 kilometers, the temperature is generally decreasing with height, and we refer to this as the troposphere. Uh, then it becomes isothermal, or constant temperature with height, before it starts to increase. Um, the layer of the atmosphere where the temperature is increasing with height we refer to as the stratosphere. Um, that's separated by the stratopause. Um, the temperature will once again decrease with height, we refer to as the mesosphere, separated by the mesopause. And then in the upper part of the atmosphere above uh, 85 kilometers, we're looking at the thermosphere where temperatures once again rise. And we refer to these different layers of the atmosphere as the troposphere, the stratosphere, the mesosphere, and the thermosphere. And 95% uh, of this class is going to be spent on talking about what's going on in the troposphere. And there might be a little bit of talk about what's going on in the stratosphere. And we're not going to talk about the mesosphere or the thermosphere at all.
So if we look at the amount of mass that's contained in each one of these layers, uh, the troposphere contains uh, about 90% of the mass of the atmosphere, the stratosphere is 9%, and less than 1% is contained in the mesosphere and the thermosphere. And just looking at this at a different perspective, going from the surface up to 500 kilometers, uh, you can see that the temperature doesn't increase uh, forever in a thermosphere. It uh, gradually uh, becomes isothermal. Um, <clears throat> and over here, I always wanted to add in the homosphere and the heterosphere. Uh, that boundary is about 90 kilometers high. The homosphere is well mixed in terms of uh, all of the constituents that are long lived are well mixed throughout the homosphere. Uh, when you get to the heterosphere, the lighter species such as hydrogen and helium uh, preferentially migrate up towards the top. And so there's a differentiation based upon molecular weight. So what is pressure? Uh, pressure is defined as a force per unit area. So if you want to think about this, we have a telephone booth, and we have a person who climbs in the bottom, and then somebody climbs on top of them to see how many people they can put in this telephone booth. And the person at the bottom has a greater force applied to them for the same area, so the pressure on them has gone up. And it'll continue going up as we pile more and more people on top of the people in the telephone booth. The person on top doesn't have much force, uh, on top of them, it doesn't have uh, much mass above them, um, so they have less pressure on the top than on the bottom. So pressure in the atmosphere can really be thought of as the weight of the gases that are above a certain level. And the units that we use, um, you know, we can talk about one atmosphere, and we're going to be using units primarily of kilopascals, and one atmosphere is equal to 101.25 kilopascals. Uh, in aviation, they often use inches of mercury, and one atmosphere is equivalent to 29.92 inches of mercury. So how does pressure change with height? Uh, so here uh, on the x-axis, we have air pressure. Uh, this is in hectopascals, so you need to divide by 10 in order to get it to kilopascals. And then you'll see that the pressure is decreasing exponentially with height. Uh, and you can see on the right a visual representation of how the molecule density changes with this increasing pressure because the gas itself is compressible. And you'll see that uh, by the time you reach the tropopause, uh, the atmospheric pressure has decreased from essentially 101.325 kilopascals all the way down to 30 kilopascals. So here's a practice exercise. <clears throat> so what is the approximate pressure at sea level? Well, in this case, it's one atmosphere, it's 1,000 millibars. Um, millibars is a hectopascal. So that would be equivalent to 100 kilopascals. What's the approximate pressure at the top of the atmosphere? Well, since there's no atmosphere above it, that has to be zero. So zero millibars, zero hectopascals, zero kilopascals. So the pressure at Salt Lake City averages about 0.85 atmospheres, which is 850 millibars or 85 kilopascals. So what fraction of the atmosphere is above Salt Lake? Well, you can see visually on the left that it's actually going to be 85% of the atmosphere is above Salt Lake City. And in contrast, what fraction of the atmosphere is below Salt Lake City? Well, that's your 15% is below. So why does this pressure decrease exponentially with height? Uh, if you go down scuba diving into the ocean, the pressure increases linearly with depth. So for every 32 feet that you go down into the ocean, it increases by one atmosphere. But the atmosphere above that 
uh, the gaseous atmosphere doesn't behave that way. And the answer is that air is a compressible gas, and the air at the bottom of the atmosphere is compressed into a smaller volume due to the higher pressure and the weight of the atmosphere that's above it, squeezing those molecules closer together. So we have several equations that we can use for pressure variation. Uh, the top one is just uh, pressure equals force divided by area. And the second equation is showing the vertical variation of pressure, where some pressure at some altitude is equal to the reference pressure at sea level times the exponent of minus A over T times Z. Um, this TV bar you will learn is eventually the virtual temperature, but we're just you can consider that to be a, just a temperature term. A is a constant and Z is the height in meters. And you can see that this is going to be an exponential decrease in pressure. Um, <clears throat> another way that uh, we can do this is to rewrite uh, the term inside the exponent as Z over the scale height of the atmosphere, HP. Um, and the scale height of the atmosphere is essentially the altitude at which the pressure will decrease by a factor of E to the minus one. Um, and in this case, the scale height of the atmosphere is a, a gas constant, uh, the um, gas constant for dry air times the virtual temperature, which we will define uh, a little bit later, divided by gravity. Um, the scale height term is something that we will use quite a bit, but we haven't introduced all of the terms that we need to be able to understand it just yet. Um, another way to look at this is the pressure at some altitude is equal to the force divided by area. Force is equal to mass times acceleration. Um, so we have the mass above a certain height times the acceleration, which in this case is gravity. And another way to think about this is the amount of mass in a given layer uh, is equal to the area of that layer divided by gravity uh, times the uh, pressure at the bottom of the layer minus the pressure at the top. And we will get a lot of practice using these types of equations uh, in class. Density is another term that we use in atmospheric sciences, and density is defined as the mass divided by the volume, and it's usually given in units of kilograms per meter cubed. Uh, we also will use the specific volume, alpha, which is defined as the inverse density, or one over the density, and has units of meters cubed per kilogram. So here's your definition for density, mass over volume. And density also decreases exponentially with height, and you can have essentially the same exponential relationship for density that you did for pressure, uh, re regardless of whether or not you use the, the form of the second equation or you use the form of the equation that has the scale height, hp, or in this case, h rho. The international standard atmosphere is how we define the normal behavior for the atmosphere. Uh, the atmosphere rarely looks like this, but uh, this is um, what we use for comparison purposes. Um, the international standard atmosphere defines the surface temperature as 15 degrees Celsius, and the tropospheric temperature change with height, otherwise known as a lapse rate, of minus six and a half degrees Celsius per kilometer. And it will continue that way all the way up to until you reach 11 kilometers. And, and then uh, it'll be an isothermal atmosphere at minus 56.5 degrees Celsius. And then the temperature will gradually increase in the stratosphere. <clears throat> If we think about gravitational potential energy, gravitational potential energy is defined as the mass times gravity times the height of an object above the surface. <clears throat> but gravity actually decreases with height uh, as you get further and further away from the center of mass. And the equation that describes that is G prime over here, which is equal to the gravitational constant times the mass of the Earth divided by the radius of the Earth plus the height above the surface. And that is uh, the Re plus H squared term. 
Um, so when you're at the surface of the Earth, you just have the, the surface gravity, and as you go up, the gravity is actually going to decrease. And because gravity decreases, if we use this equation for the potential energy, mgh, we're going to overestimate the um, amount of potential energy uh, because the gravity is not as strong as what we were uh, actually calculating. So we could, uh, as atmospheric scientists, uh, adjust gravity uh, with height, uh, but what we've actually chosen to do is to use constant gravity and adjust the height definition to ensure that an air parcel has the proper potential energy. And we call this adjusted height the geopotential height. And so um, <clears throat> the geopotential height does not equal the geometric height. Uh, it's actually going to be typically be a little bit lower uh, than the uh, geometric height. And then we have the term geopotential which is defined as the work done against gravity to lift one kilogram of mass from sea level up to a given geopotential height. Uh, geopotential height is defined as h, uh, is equal to the radius of the Earth, r0, uh, times the geometric height, z, um, divided by r0 plus z. Uh, that's our geopotential height. Um, our geometric height, this can be rearranged to get your geometric height if you happen to know the geopotential height. And then we have that geopotential term, which is the energy term. Uh, the geopotential is equal to gravity times the geopotential height. And we'll become a lot more familiar with these equations as we start to use them uh, along the way.